while they were playing their own small-minded games, they didn't see the power encounter. There is no difference between a missionary and a disciple. The missionary we've labelled, but they're just brave enough to go. His disciples are a significant part of God's plan as labourers in the harvest. My name is Ray Budge, for those who don't know. I am an elder here in the church and I just appreciate the opportunity to to share this morning with you. And uh, I want to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, um, we just love the fellowship of saints. And we invite you in, Lord, not because you're not here, but because with our lips we want to just declare that we are nothing without you. And we ask you by your Holy Spirit, use this word that, um, that it might speak to, you, to who you are, to the glory of your name and to the encouragement of the saints. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we, for those of you who are visiting, um, have been going through the scriptures. Um, This year it's um, been uh, the uh, book of Matthew. And as we've been going through, we've just been discovering mighty, mighty gems. We've broken it up into sections and and this particular section we're just coming to the end of is talking about the authority of Jesus. And I just want to sort of do a snapshot and wrap it up a little bit and um, be a bit of a segue into the next. So this passage um, talks about his authority. He's come, um, he's just now come back Uh, from the area of the Gadarenes and is now in Capernaum, a place in Galilee um, and in Isaiah 1, it talks about Galilee of of the Gentiles. And I love that when we we did uh, Corinthians last year, we learnt that that, uh, Corinth was a city much like our own. And it gives a testimony to us that, you know, we sit here among a very diverse people and we enjoy the company of the saints as we look forward, as Michael shared this morning, to that harvest. We look forward to the coming day when we can see many cultures and ta-ethnic, uh, ta-ethne, ethnic groups sitting at that table and sharing together. Galilee of the Gentiles. I find it really interesting that Jesus, while Bethlehem is significant, while Nazareth is significant, Capernaum is the place that he called home. I think that's awesome. Here's this place of the Gentiles that he said, this is my home. I'm comfortable here. I think he's comfortable here. I really believe that. I felt the Holy Spirit just going, yes, I love this place. So just to recap, um, over the last couple of weeks or so, we've been looking at Jesus' authority. And in these, these verses uh, that we're reading this morning, we've, we've watched how Jesus has authority over the physical realm. That's physical healing. And the first encounter here is Jesus healing two blind men. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the the equivalent of saying, he is the Lord, he is the Son of God. And so they went to seek his help. If you're here this morning seeking his help, you've come to the the right person. Jesus, in turn, heals them based on their faith. He said, according to your faith, and he is faithful. This was a clear demonstration of his power over physical limitations. I'm not a great example, but I can pray. And I know that I'm praying to a God who is there, a God who has power, and a God who is trustworthy. This this encourages me to remain faithful. 
to remain prayerful and to see the name of the Lord glorified. In this passage, it also shows Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm. Jesus wasn't just about fixing problems. As he walked among the people, he confronted spiritual needs. And this um, encounter with the, with the mute is definitely an encounter of, of that, that calibre. As he walked among the people, he confronted their spiritual needs. He healed the man physically, but he cast out a demon and gave him back his, his voice. And this totally showed that Jesus' power was over the unseen world. Knowing who Jesus truly is, we can't ignore the double win here. His powerful love on the cross and the hope of resurrection. You know, it was all on display right there. He's saying, I am who I am. Here's the power of heaven. And these things assure us that Jesus has power over anything. Anything that would seek to drag us down or anyone else into sin and death. His authority challenged the status quo, the social dimensions of life. The Pharisees, the religious leaders who had worked hard to gain prominence in the community, can't deny the miraculous healings, but they try to discredit him. They tried by attributing Jesus' power to the power of demonic forces. Their opposition to Jesus' authority is clearly representative of our own discomfort when our own established social and religious order is challenged. The stuff that we call norm. Oh, this is the way we do it. You know the stuff I'm talking about. Areas of our lives where we've allowed ourselves to become comfortable or we've normalised behaviours which have become a barrier to others being able to approach Christ just as they are. I always remember the old hymn that enabled me to boldly approach Christ at the end of the service here, in this church. Just as I am. Yeah? Yeah. How many of us came to the foot of the cross at that hymn? You know... I didn't do that boldly. It wasn't a sense of entitlement that brought me to the cross. But I was born again in the security of knowing that I would be accepted by God in Christ himself and through his forgiveness. This was and remains my trust and hope in his people that this same acceptance would remain a part of the testimony of Coffs Harbour Baptist Church. Jesus' authority was really epitomised and empowered by compassion. The passage concludes with Jesus' compassion for the crowds. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd, lost and without direction. His compassion extends to calling out the wolves in shepherd's clothing. And it's a reminder to all of us that what sounds holy and righteous needs to be examined. His response, when the scribes accused him of doing the work of Satan, however, is similar to the scribes and Pharisees' accusation of Jesus later in Matthew. But in this instance... He warns them that a house divided against itself will not stand. That's Matthew 12. And reminds them of the hypocrisy of their own arguments. He also suggests that they're accusing themselves of blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. In this, in this instance, though, he was exercised, 
or he has exercised divine patience, which he does with all of us. I don't know about you, but whenever I think of God's amazing patience with me, I think of a picture that was given to me a long time ago. Locals, you know, on the highway coming down to um, the crossing of, of um, Combine Street. It sort of slopes a little bit. But if you're driving a Mack truck, you know, you approach those lights very carefully and you sit with a pumping motor. You know, it's very powerful. A strong, strong motor, just ready to take off, but it's, it's waiting for the lights, just waiting for that time to say go. I think Jesus exercised incredible patience at such times when, when he was being accused of, of being a, a tool of the enemy, a tool of Satan. He called them out, but in this instance... He was, he was that Mack truck. He was power under control. He's waiting for the right time. He could have snapped his fingers and it would have all ended right there. But his patience extends to us in compassion. His patience led me to the cross. His patience waits for all of us. It also gives us a way that we too... This patience gives us a way that we can test whether something is from Satan or from from God. The question we should always ask is, does this bring glory to God? That's the question we should be asked if we're testing things. We need to also be constantly monitoring our own responses evaluating them like the people did in verse 33. They saw. They said nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel and they were amazed. They were giving glory to his name. His compassion motivated him to send out more disciples and highlights our inclusion in sharing the gospel message. His compassion further establishes his authority, as someone whose caring is motivated by his love for people's spiritual and physical needs. So I just want to break the passage into three themes, and I've put those themes into, um, that was my breakdown on, as a summary of where we've gone over the last uh, little bit. But the next, I just want to, I just want to outline the three themes that I've, I've really picked out of this this passage and the first theme is healing and compassion from verse 27 to 31 as Jesus went on from there two men followed him calling out have mercy on us son of David when he entered the house the blind men approached him and Jesus said to them do you believe that I can do this and they said to him yes lord Then he touched their eyes, saying, Let it be done for you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. Then Jesus warned them sternly, Be sure that no one finds out. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout the whole area. (laughs) I love that bit. Jesus demonstrates his authority and his compassion by healing the two men. Their faith in him leads them to their sight being restored. The mute man is also healed after the demon is driven out. The crowds are amazed and these miraculous acts are only part of his whole story as he's journeyed uh, through this area. Jesus' compassion for the distressed and dejected crowds is evident. He seeks them as lost sheep without a shepherd or he sees them. In fact, the warning about not telling anyone seems to, to me to be more about he's told them for their own sake. John 9.22 tells me that if anyone confessed Jesus as Messiah, they would be banned from the synagogue. They would be disfellowshipped. They would be outcast. The Jews made sure of that. 
So Jesus was really having compassion on those people that were declaring who he was. Following Jesus can cost something, guys. But these men, these women also, could not contain themselves. There's so many examples of people that Jesus touched. The declaration went out among, among the people. The second theme that I looked at was authority and opposition. Just as they were going out, a demon-possessed man who was unable to speak was brought to him. And when the demon had been driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He drives out demons by the ruler of demons. A couple of weeks ago, Stephen highlighted Jesus' authority to forgive sins. And when the scribes questioned his authority to forgive the paralytic man, Jesus turned their opposition into a demonstration of power. And he healed the man in order to provide proof of his identity. This time, it was the Pharisees, the I am holier than thou group, who accused Jesus of casting out demons by demonic power. Such opposition highlights the ongoing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. Young people, or anyone who's a gamer, who can confess to playing games? <laughs> oh no, there's some big hands gone up too. <laughs> okay. Just imagine for a moment, <laughs> you're the best gamer in your area. And yeah, probably. <laughs> oh dear. And you have the game mapped out before you. You know where you're going. You know what you're going to do. But something doesn't go to plan. And you might lose your title. Jesus was doing things the Pharisees didn't get. And it made them feel like their top spot was in danger. So instead of trying to figure out who Jesus was and where his authority came from, they accused him and tried to set him up like he was some evil video game uh, villain or something. The real issue, issue was that while they were playing their own small-minded games, they didn't see the power encounter and that, that, um, that happened between Jesus and the demon. This was not a game. This is the truth and this is what happened. Fellow believers, let's be clear that God will work in his ways and on his terms. But for whatever reason, let us be careful of becoming a critical spirit. We could be found to be siding with the devil. God has given us permission to choose how we respond to him. I love that. Right from the beginning, he created us. He gave us permission. It's part of that design. He's given us freedom. But next time you're frustrated, or when someone doesn't do stuff the way you think it should be done, when we're challenged, remember that calling something the work of the enemy might not be the right move. The last theme I want to highlight is the harvest and the labourers. And I thank Michael for, for that this morning because that really highlights that that's where we're... That's the game that we're in at the moment. This is the season of a harvest that we're looking forward to. And Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd, and he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. 
Jesus recognizes the huge, spirit, huge spiritual need among the people and he compares it to an overwhelming harvest. No wonder he, you know, at times he cried, he wept over Jerusalem. We have a harvest before us. It's huge. And we all play our small parts. We all have a work to be done. He instructed his disciples to pray, to pray for more workers to be sent into the harvest field. And he emphasised the urgency of spreading the good news of the kingdom. And that's my little spoiler alert. The next five weeks are going to be on mission. So let's indulge ourselves in, in finding out what is our purpose in the mission of God. Jesus' authority, as he looked out to the harvest field, he also prepared and sent others to follow. He sent them out in his own name, in his own authority. And we carry that. As Christians, we carry his name. We carry his authority. We have to treasure that name so carefully. As Christians, as Christ ones, as disciples of Christ, he gives us the same mission call. Jesus, at the end of Matthew, came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. I'm going to embarrass a few people here, maybe, but I'm just going to ask anyone who is a missionary, anyone who's been a missionary, and you can be a missionary kid, I'm going to ask you if you would stand. If you would stand. Beautiful. There's some people here I don't recognise, and that's really beautiful. Those among us, thank you. I'm going to keep you standing because I'm going to ask <laughs> those of you of, who are disciples of Jesus, stand. You know, guess what? There is no difference between a missionary and a disciple. Thanks, you can sit down. <laughs> there is no difference between a missionary and a disciple. The missionary we've labelled, but they're just brave enough to go. <laughs> I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that Jesus has given all of us. You know, um, the title of this message had... Um, mentioned Jesus and his authority and the word limited. And I was pondering and pondering that this week. How is, how, is, how is he limited? Because God himself is not limited. And I real, realise that the only way that his authority in, is in any way limited is if we don't step up and follow the call because we are all his disciples. You know, overall, this passage portrays Jesus' authority as multidimensional. It encompasses power over the physical and spiritual realms. It challenges the, the status quo. It offers us a model, a model of deep concern for the spiritual welfare and eternal worth of his people. It all, also underscores Jesus' compassion, his authority and mission to heal, to teach and bring salvation to those in need. But, but how do we, as disciples, 
take up the call and live this out. True discipleship brings a message of healing and compassion. Our faith is a bridge. The blind men and the mute man received healing because of their faith, but also because of Jesus' authority. And this highlights how our faith can act as a bridge, allowing us to both receive and benefit from the power of Christ at work in us and through us. The power of the cross, though, is that it is other-centred. It's not me-centred. The power of the cross means I'm, I'm centred on other people. And disciples can cultivate faith in others and point them to Christ for their own healing. As we learned in the beginning of this chapter, Jesus prioritises forgiveness and reconciliation. We can be a bridge well, for that. Welcome to you all. Our compassion needs to be active. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Jesus' compassion wasn't just emotional. It translated into action. And his, his disciples, as his disciples, we too can live this out by showing care for the sick and suffering, becoming instruments of God's healing touch. Disciples of Jesus, when they move in authority, will have opposition. But true disciples will live by example, by his example. When questioned about authority, Jesus didn't argue. He demonstrated it. Disciples can follow this approach. Living righteously and letting their prayerful and obedient actions speak for their faith. When di disciples step out in faith, they will face opposition. Jesus faced resistance from religious leaders, yet he remained steadfast. Disciples, guys, you should expect such opposition, but you can find strength in knowing that Christ has already overcome the world. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, however, be courageous. I have conquered the world. John 16.33 And the last thing I want to say is disciples are a significant part of God's plan as labourers in the harvest. We're included in all this. That's the mighty thing. God is not limited. He himself is not limited. We limit. He's anticipated what he was sharing. He's anticipated a spiritual harvest. And we're given the opportunity to step on board. This is a plan for making disciples. This is um, putting my elder's hat on and saying, this is our plan. This is, this is the plan for the church. This is Jesus' plan that he's given to us. To make disciples. I just want to intervene here. We have a... Some of you might remember Chris Caldas from last year. Chris was a, a pioneers um, a worker for uh, working at Sherwood Cliffs for a little while. And um, part of her call to Australia was to learn English. We used to, we used to um, have conversations through the telephone, you know, Google Translate, just so that she could start to learn. She's just been through a rigorous global discipleship program with pioneers. Um, Part of her journey to Australia was in the hope that she might be able to become a missionary. She's a, a, a football coach. She's a physiotherapist. She's an amazing woman of God. 
And, um, and in the last couple of weeks, I'm just going to share, in the middle of the process of the plan to come to Australia and then eventually to go and work amongst Muslims, uh, she says, the plan for me to participate in a sports team and work as a coach did not work out. And so we decided that I would go straight to Malaysia from Australia and that I would still have two and a half years to return to Brazil for a vacation. But in the last few weeks, God connected me with Coach Louis. Now I know him as Louis Barron um, again. And the official invitation was made for me to stay another year in Australia and go to a school to study English and work voluntarily as a football coach together with Louis Barron. He's, he's an Englishman and he does an amazing, amazing work amongst migrant kids and his team. Um, and after a year, I'll be able to go on vacation to Brazil and then back on track for working with Muslims. I think it's just an exciting, exciting thing for, for Chris. You know, God calls us to step out. He called her 10 years ago. And in that call... She influenced other people because she stepped out. She believed. We too, we have the opportunity to step out and step up with God. Jesus emphasised that we, we need more labourers. Disciples can live this out by sharing their faith and inviting others to follow Jesus. This can involve act of, acts of service, power encounters, the sharing of our testimonies or simply having open conversations. But prayer is our tool. And Jesus instructs his disciples to pray. Pray for more labourers. Disciples can actively pray for God to raise up new believers and equip them for ministry. There are many ways that we can actively engage with the world beyond our own small sphere of influence. And we are called in this place that I see is so similar to the Galilee of the Gentiles. I was just really interested as I studied this, I was, when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, I'll meet you at Galilee. He rose from the dead and he went to the place of the Gentiles. He's calling, he's calling every culture, he's calling all of us. The risen Christ was here in Coffs Harbour before any of us arrived. This is his world. And just as Jesus taught his disciples to fish for men, I'm also aware that this is what he's doing today among his people here. I want to close, and I want to close recognising a man. If you could put that uh, photo up. I want us to recognise a man who we know as Shane Bendall. He, he was rescued... The Lord plucked him out of the fire, saved him and gave him a place in the kingdom and he recognised, he recognised that he was called. He came to Sherwood for a time and whilst he was suffering um, from some health issues, Shane was called home to be with the Lord this week and um, died quietly, I believe. I just, I just thank God that his, his heart took him to the Philippines most recently and Damien, um, uh, the, the um, person who he and his wife and family are working over there, Shane went and helped them establish a mission over there. His days in the Lord were fruitful. Coming back to Mike's um, communion message, 
may it be that we too live a fruitful life. And when he calls us home, that we'll be able to just be so free and open-armed. The Lord is saying to us, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Shane has le left a legacy. What legacy are you going to leave?